like this. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, coming and being involved. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's okay. I've got a couple of Vertex watches here to show people. Oh, now, I have a couple as well. I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> um, anyway, so I suppose we ought to start because people have been waiting. It's quite unnerving not knowing who's watching. I know, it's really um, strange. There are 50 people, apparently. There are, and I've also got it live on Facebook and there's some more people on there, but it's yeah. fine. Right, well, we're trying to think about that. It'd be much better if it's in front of a live audience, but... Um, Next time. It's the way of the world now, isn't it? Yeah. So um, what we're going to talk about, uh, prompted by the fact that Fellows has got a set of interesting war watches for sale at the end of August in your auction, um, we're going to talk about um, the history of war watches and where they came from and how they came to be the way they are not so much now, but really in, into the Second World War and slightly beyond. So, um, but the interesting thing about war watches is that they're very much um, part of the development of the wristwatch itself. Um, because people often say, and it's probably true, that Louis Cartier was the first person to um, make a wristwatch for commercial sale after he made um, one for his aviator friend, um, Santos Dumont. Um, but in actual fact, the wristwatch goes back before then. We've heard that um, possibly Queen, Queen Victoria had a wristwatch made by Patek Philippe, but wow. in actual fact, as far as um, anybody knows, the first wristwatches for men um, were made as a result of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm in the 19th century. And the story is that he went to, the, went to a, a trade show in Berlin and he saw a chap there called Constant Girard who was uh, one half of Gerard Perigo, and he um, commissioned him to produce some watches that his uh, great army could wear. Um, and these are watches that would be worn on the wrist. And um, <clears throat> they were really the first wrist watches that people seem to, seem to have heard of being made in any quantity. So it's thanks to him that these, um, the wrist watch came about in some ways, but equally it was pretty much forgotten um, after the first batch was produced in 1880. About 2,000 were made, and um, many of these were um, sold in America as well. 2,000 were made for the Kaiser, and a few more in, sold in America. But the pocket watch remained dominant um, right up until, you know, into the 20th century. It was actually the, um, the next war, the big war, the 1914-18 Great War, that caused, like many things, a sort of case of necessity being the mother of in invention. And um, obviously in the early stages of the war, particularly on the Western Front, where troops were spending, you know, days, sometimes weeks in these sort of horrible rat infested, mud soaked trenches. You know, you've seen them in films like 1917, that was released this year, um, in the battlefield, you know, stretching from Belgium all the way to, to Switzerland almost. Conditions were horrendous, um, you know, wooden duck boards to walk on, but not really making much difference to the, the huge quantity of water sloshing about, dust everywhere and mud, um, and obviously terrible weather, so lots of damp to get into, into watch cases and so on. Um, and everything used to break, you know, all sorts of equipment broke, guns, cooking equipment, um, navigational equipment, all that sort of stuff. Um, and obviously pocket watches, which were then the norm, were, um, were not really very suitable for that at all because they were completely sort of lacking in resilience. And the other problem was they were very inconvenient because, you know, if somebody wanted to check the time, because time, time was very significant to um, the launching of, of missiles and to sort of going over the top of the trenches. Um, they were completely useless, really, these pocket watches. So fairly soon, um, sorry, I'm just going to adjust my screen. If fairly I soon, um, it was decided to start welding uh, lugs or soldering lugs onto pocket watch cases. And um, you've got some examples here. These, these are typical, that, particularly that second watch there. Um, that is probably a converted pocket watch. And still got the hunting case, you know, to cover it over to to, to keep it safe. Um, but at the time, they were <clears throat> pretty much sort of handmade and cobbled together. You know, they were kind of make make do watches in a way. They weren't commercially available. And um, 
the majority of them were, were used by officers because it was officers who needed to know the time because it was the officers who were going to tell people when to do things and the officers who needed to know when things were meant to be happening. So they were generally called trench watchers, but also officers' watchers. And the officers, the officer case, which is still um, available today on certain watches with a hinge back, um, is so called because these hinged covers protected the the dial of the watch in, in difficult situations. Um, strangely enough, one of the best known trench watch designs was uh, patented right back in the 1890s for a pocket watch. And it was a case maker called Francois Bourgel. And he designed a system in which the, um, the watch head could be screwed into a, into a sort of secondary outer case. And um, that would give added protection to, to the watch. Um, he died obviously before the war, he died in 1912. But his daughter, uh, who was called Louisa, I think, she, um, she carried on the business and made a few watches like this, um, but with the, outer, the extra outer case for, for protection. Um, yeah, in the early stages of, of trench watches and officers, officer watches, the, the watches worn by soldiers were, were usually bought by them. They weren't issued by the, um, by the armies involved. Um, but within a year or so, you know, most soldiers, most officers for sure, were wearing these sort of trendy latest uh, gadgets, these wristwatches. And um, there are a couple of quite nice mentions which, which give an idea of how important watches had become in a short space of time to the military. Um, there are a couple of nice mentions in, in writings, one of which uh, was by Robert Graves, the, the, the war poet. And in his autobiography, autobiography, Goodbye to All That, he talks about his time at the front um, as a Welsh fusilier. And he, he says, um, in Now It Can Be Told, he talks, um, sorry, uh, um, Philip Gibbs, who was a, a war correspondent, um, in his book, Now It Can Be Told, he related a, a wonderful scene, very sort of atmospheric and poignant, um, that he witnessed during one of the battles around Hougé in Flanders. And I've got a little uh, paragraph about it here, which I'm going to read out to you. So he says, the men deployed before dawn broke, waiting for the preliminary bombardment, which would smash away for them. The officers struck matches now and then to glance at their wristwatches, set very carefully to those of the gunners. And then our artillery burst forth with an enormous violence of shell fire, so that the night was shattered with the tumult of it. The men listened and waited. And as soon as the guns lengthened their fuses, the infantry advance would begin. Then the time came, the watch hands pointed to the second which had been given for the assault to begin. And instantly to the tick, the guns lifted and made a curtain of the fire around the Chateau of Rouge, beyond the men in road, 600 yards away. Time, the company officers blew their whistles, and there was a sudden clatter from trench spades stung to rifle barrels, and from men girded with hand grenades as the advancing companies deployed and made their first rush forward. So it just sort of shows how important time was. And you can imagine the sort of the stillness and the silence before they had to do that. And they were just waiting for that, that officer to look at his watch and, and give the command. And then uh, no doubt not many of them came back from that. Anyway, but by sort of 1916, 1917, um, these watches that people had started buying for themselves um, because they were quite useful things to have. It had really become um, official parts of, of military equipment. And um, it was actually, they were actually described as a luminous rock watch with an unbreakable glass, which was considered to be um, an essential piece of operational equipment. And um, it was put at the top of the list in a, in a handbook for the front. It was written by a captain in the King's Own Scottish Borderers. And that was the watch was on the list ahead of you know anything like a revolver or binoculars or a compass or any of those things that you might um, normally consider essential and smiths in particular created a, a watch with a what's called a ub crystal which um even to this day nobody seems to know exactly what it was made from but it was some material that was kind of acrylic based but um very difficult to break um, but as i say nobody seems to have been able to work out exactly what it was um, but of course, the you know the popularity of the wristwatch and the fact that these officers officers were coming back home uh, after being in the trenches and, and at the front wearing them um, 
civilians started to look at them and they started to realize it was a much better idea to wear a watch on your wrist um, than have one in your pocket and it, and you put here uh, this picture um, of various designs of trench watch and these are all um, covered in a way that you didn't need to lift the cover off in order to be able to to see the time and they were called particularly that one the second one from the left that was known as a telephone dial watch for, for obvious reasons and then you've got variations on the theme you know you've got just a, a simple grid on the um on the one first one from the last one from the end and then a more elaborate design um on the fifth one which is a sort of swirling design which still allows you to to see all the numbers but gives pretty good protection to the dial so um yeah when these officers started coming home um they um they spread the word about wristwatches and, and other people got interested and various uh, jewelers and watchmakers and watch retailers started to catch on to it and they um in particular there was one uh, wholesaler called williamson and they owned the Buren watch factory in, in switzerland which um <clears throat> carried on for many decades and became became very famous actually for various innovations but um uh, their advertisement they said um the one soldier in every four wears a wristlet watch and the other three mean to get one as soon as they can in these days the watch is as necessary as a hat more so in fact because one can catch a train without a hat but not without a watch so that was um early 20th century watch marketing but back on that on the battlefield the the watches was proving indispensable for the time maneuvers such as what they call the creeping barrage in which are artillery guns were moved forward in very small increments to clear the way for infantry to to advance to the, in, in front of them um, and it was very important that accurate artillery fire um, was carried out for that to happen and that's where the idea of what they call a telemetric scale came from which is a simple scale on the on the dial of the watch it's often in a sort of snail like pattern um, and so it enabled the um, artillery officer to calculate the distance between where the gun was and where the shell landed and um, <clears throat> that would give an idea as to the, the distance between them and the um, and the opposition sort of thing and they could also time it the other way around you know they could hear a shell coming from the other side time when it landed and that would give them as i say an idea of, of where everybody was um, Basically, what, what the way it worked, you'd set the chronograph hand going when the gun was fired, stop it when the shell landed, and the approximate distance between those two events could be could be read off the, the telemetric scale. So, um, and around the time of the of the first war um, was also the time when when Rolex was was set up, and not everybody knows, but it was actually founded in London originally. Uh, well, it's a Swiss company. And um, before the war, the Swiss had been making, working on making much smaller movements, which were much better for wristwatches. Um, and production was increased by different brands to, to cope with this sort of rising demand from, from the military. Um, unfortunately, instead of sort of welcoming the arrival of these mass produced wristwatches, the British government um, decided to put a, an import tax on them. In 1915, right in the middle of the, of the First World War, and that led to to Rolex setting up um, an office in Switzerland, um, so that they could um, make watches over there and uh, and you know sell them elsewhere rather than have their office specifically in London and bring bring um, watches in, in from Switzerland that way. Um, <clears throat> but there are plenty of other uh, plenty of other British makers. Um, who were offering watches, uh, Mappin and Webb in, in particular, did some quite nice ones. And you've got here these fantastic adverts that uh, they introduced. And you can see now how even the, even in the Mappin and Webb very early, the, the strap, the sort of design of the strap has changed. And this is, they haven't bothered converting that pocket watch, they've just made a strap that holds the pocket watch body um, without bothering to sort of sell the lugs onto it. But then, um, the Mappin and Webb campaign watch here, which is a, this nice wording. Um, the famed campaign watch has two pounds and ten shillings. And um, there was another company called JC Bickery. I don't know if you have an ad, but you've got that one, yeah, which is wonderful, right? That's um, <clears throat> they called it the um, the perfectly reliable active service wristwatch, three pounds and three shillings. Um, 
and goldsmiths also had their military luminous watch. Of course, the same, they had the compulsory luminous hands and figures, as they called them. Although they weren't compulsory at all, they meant compulsory in terms of, in order for a watch to be effective in, in that line of duty, then uh, it would be desirable to have those features. Um, <clears throat> of course, having a luminous watch, you know, that, that came about as a result of having luminous paint, and luminous paint was actually, at the time, um, radium-based which actually probably helped kill quite a few people um, during the war as well. Because um, it got a radioactive half-life out of about 15 or 1600 years. And um, often when these dials were being painted, the people doing it, would they would lick their paintbrush and they'd keep it moist. Paint the numbers on in, in this radium paint and then lick the brush again, doing that over a long period of time. They're obviously ingesting radium and um, not really very good for you. Um, but it's not really toward, until towards the end of the, of the First World War that the British military began to properly evaluate watches and issue them as, as standard equipment. Um, and it was then that the, the broad arrow mark was first seen on a watch and um, usually stamped on the cases. And it would be an arrow pointing to the right to denote military property. And if it had a second arrow pointing to the left, it would have meant that it had been, um, it was decommissioned, which meant that if somebody, you know, was seen with the watch, then it would be, um, it would be accepted that they'd, they'd acquired it legitimately rather than just sort of taking it away from the stalls or taking it away when they left, they left the army. But the arrow is uh, very interesting and it's, it's become a sort of symbol of authenticity now on watches made today. There are quite a few brands have been using it, um, but it is actually illegal to use it without permission. The, um, it's, it's officially called a, um, a Fion. It date, dates right back to the 1600s in, in Britain. Um, and it was used back then to denote any object that had been bought by, uh, by money, the money of the monarch um, and was therefore owned by either the king or the government. So initially it was the Royal Navy or the Navy that, uh, that used the Fion. And you would often see um, sort of cannon with this Fion arrow um, stamped into the barrel. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it was used on prison uniform as well, the arrows on prison uniform. They weren't there to sort of specifically denote a prisoner, but they were there to denote the fact that the prisoner was wearing property that belonged to the government. Uh, so if they went on the run, they'd stand out pretty, pretty easily. Um, <clears throat> But today the broad arrow is used almost exclusively by the by the Ministry of Defence. And as I say, it's I think an offence to use it without special permission. Um, but because these military watches were now considered to be essential equipment and were sort of official, um, certain specifications were, were required. And usually it was a I've got a couple of examples actually, or typical example of a um, this is a modern version <clears throat> of a military watch. Actually, I, I think you've got some pictures there, Alexander. If you could put a, an older military watch up. Yes, the, the, these are fairly good examples. So these are um, watches that tend to, they would have a, a, large, a large crown typically, so that they could be easily wound in, in difficult conditions. You, always a black dial um, <clears throat> and a, a numbering system that would be either used for timing um, individual seconds and minutes, with the actual hour being less important in this first one here. This is a very typical pilot's watch. Um, and of course, they had to be easy to operate, you know, with, with cold hands or gloved hands, which is, as I say, is why they have these large crowns. Um, and they should ideally be, you know, able to resist sort of the ingress of dirt and water, um, and possibly have a back that screws down. And the glass should be, you know, a bit tougher than normal. And that subsidiary seconds, as I say, could be used for, um, you know, for timing um, short events, you know, you know, the prelude to, to launching missiles and so on. Um, so I'll explain some of the sort of origins of the military watch and the wristwatch in general, I suppose. But it was really during the Second World War that um, the sort of watches that we're more, we see more commonly uh, came about. And these really were sort of built specifically for the task. And um, those in aviation watches are probably the most recognizable. Um, and they were made by brands such as Larco and Langer 
Langenzona and IWC. Um, IWC in particular introduced a, a pilot's watch in, in around about 1940, which they which it supplied to the Luftwaffe. Although the uh, the brand nowadays tends to talk more about the fact that it was um, it was supplied to the RAF, which uh, it was in the form of the Mark 11, which is a bit of a smaller watch than the big the big um, watches they supplied to, to the Luftwaffe. Um, because the Luftwaffe watch was, was enormous, a 55 millimeter uh, case and a very sort of tough hand wound caliber 52 movement it was called, with a stop seconds feature so you could stop the second and um, set the watch very accurately. And again it had that big, what they call an onion crown, to make it easy to use in difficult conditions and so on. But um, apart from those watches, one of the very famous military designs was by um by panerai and the brand today is owned by richemont and a very you know very successful luxury watch brand but really panerai was actually a maker um, of optical instruments in italy during the early 1900s mm. and um the panerai family it was, a, it was a small family in business the panerai family was asked to develop a wristwatch that could be used by the italian navy uh, in particular, the Navy divers and the um, and the and the and the, uh, the the naval operators of the midget submarines that they used to actually travel on underwater and then um, attach explosives to the hulls of ships. So these um, so Panerai was never a watchmaker. So in order to create these watches, they used um, a Rolex movement. They created a watch. It was called the Reference Three Six Four Six. And uh, there's an example of it there. And um, it used a Rolex movement, and it actually used a Rolex case, in fact. I mean, it, it, the, the Panerai case is based, or a direct, it's a direct copy of a Rolex uh, pocket watch case with the, um, with the winding crown, obviously, turned to three o'clock. Um, <clears throat> Now these watches have become hugely sought after. In fact, any Panerai military watch with a, a military history is extremely valuable now. Um, the record price for a Panerai, I'm just going to have to check that, um, is $478,000. And that wasn't paid for a 3646, but it was a, um, a prototype of a watch called the Luminor um, Reference 6152. It was sold by the descendants of its original owner, who was an Italian uh, naval admiral called Gino Birundelli. He died in 2008, and um, he was almost 100 years old. I think he was 96, 97. And this luminal watch was a, um, a prototype, a huge 57 millimeter by 46 millimeter case, and um, a unique uh, transparent bezel made from a sort of polycarbonate. Um, it was a prototype which presumably he'd been asked to evaluate and it, it held on to. It was never actually put into production, which is why it made such a huge amount of money when it came up for sale. Um, but more common at auction are the reference 3646. And they started to become really valuable only about three years ago when um, in Geneva, I think Philips sold one for $75,000 which was a, a watch that had been <clears throat> supplied to the German uh, camp swimmers who were under an underwater unit who would, you know, they would do things like uh, sort of swim up to bridges and, and uh, rig them with explosives and things. And um, there's an example of one of these uh, radiomeres. <clears throat> and um, the one at Philips was uh, originally owned by um, a recruit called Helmut Rosa. And he wore it on missions as a member of this elite, elite sort of special marine unit that they had. And um, the, that particular watch was sold complete with his underwater wrist compass, which, which Panerai also made, which is a sort of matching item to the, to the watches. Um, in 2019, so you know, the beginning of last year, a, a, a very sort of beaten up Radiomir that had belonged to a, another Italian admiral um, called Amadeo Vesco. That sold for 225,000 euros at Antiquan in Monaco. But um, I think it's probably fair to say that it's fellows um, who have turned up a couple of the most interesting uh, Panerais in recent times. Um, the first one was a, a, a 3646 that belonged to a reconnaissance corps soldier called George Rosen. 
and um, Fellows, here it is, yes, that's the one. Um, Fellows offered that for sale um, a couple of years ago, I think. And he had, uh, uh, George Rosen had seized it from a, a German camp swimmer who was trying to blow up uh, the Nijmegen Bridge in 1944 during a very famous military operation called uh, Operation Market Garden, which was uh, a typically a typically sort of uh, quirky English military way of saying that this thing was happening in um, in in Holland, um, and they were trying to liberate the Dutch cities of uh, Nijmegen and Eindhoven. And um, yes, that watch made fifty-two thousand pounds, just over fifty-two thousand pounds, I think. So directly from uh, Rosen's family, and um, he also included it was also including a, a handwritten account of the operation and of how he acquired the watch, which was basically by um, by taking it from this camp swimmer. Um, and strangely enough, although it's obviously a rare watch, the the fact that it was for sale and the publicity that came with it um, prompted the sale of another one, which was sold last year, I think also seized from another camp swimmer by um, a British soldier, uh, Captain Alfred Packer, the 43rd Reconnaissance Regiment. And that um, that was put into auction at Fenners by Captain Packer's son, along with the personal diaries, which you can actually see in that photograph, you see the watch laid on top of the, of the diaries. Um, service records, his military tunic, and his Reconnaissance Regiment badges. So you can see there are no, what, no lugs on the watch because they were, as I mentioned earlier, these were really a sort of Rolex pocket watch case that was adapted. So the lugs were probably slightly fragile at times, particularly after you know, seeing difficult heavy service in, 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 in conflict. Um, but that didn't really make any difference. What did make a difference was the fact that the watch um, had such a fantastic provenance, you know, to come direct from the, the family of, of, um, of this particular serviceman. And they had all his records, and that makes a really big difference, you know, knowing um, exactly what a watch has done. And uh, the story that goes with it is almost as valuable as the watch itself in some ways. So you have the two together, then it makes a huge difference. Um, so by 1939, which is you know before this this watch was was made, probably um, a wristwatch was considered essential, really, to uh, to all members of the military, it didn't matter where you were, but particularly in our case, we're interested in, um, in the British military. And um, so plenty of firms were commissioned to, to make military specific watches. And um, that included Hamilton in America, and Smiths in England, and all the big Swiss makers, you know, such as uh, Omega, and Nogi, and Giget, and Tissot. Um, they all sort of made watches for military use and they were all pretty much to the same specification. Um, and quite a few of them apparently refused to supply these watches to, to, to German arms. Um, <clears throat> and then of course there were watches for, for pilots, you know, Breitling already had a, a history of that because it was the, the maker of the first uh, wrist chronograph, which it did, did way back in 1915, and um, so really at the very beginning of, of um, wristwatch design, or, or sort of wristwatches being produced on a large scale, um, and they were the official RAF uh, supplier during the 1930s as well. Um, and Breitling created the famous circular slide rule that enabled pilots to um, make some sort of speed and distance and fuel uh, consumption calculations by using the watch. Um, and that slide rule is still on the modern Navitimer uh, wristwatch. It's incredibly difficult to use and extremely small, but uh, it was certainly something that was used in, when it was first first made available. Um, but as we said at the beginning, the, the whole inspiration for doing this, uh, the whole idea behind this talk is to um, is to highlight a set of watches that are going to be sold at the end of the month by fellows. And these um, are a set, a set of so-called dirty dozen watches. And um, the reason they are called dirty dozen is because there were 12 of them. And they were made by 12 different manufacturers. I'll read those out. They're Burin, uh, Sima, Eterna, Grana, Gégé, 
Nemanja, Longine, IWC, Omega, Record, Timor, and Vertex. So there's now quite a, um, a strong following for these watches, especially um, if you can get an entire set, one of each of the 12 mates. And they've rarely come up for sale, actually. Um, but I guess people are now looking out for the individual watches and, and putting them together um, as a set, which um, is exactly what we've got here um, to be sold at the end of the month. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about these watches, you'll see, although they've got different dial names, they're all basically the same. And the reason for that is that the, um, the Ministry of Defence um, had a very specific, had very specific criteria for what they consider to be a suitable military watch. And they called it a WWW, which um, <clears throat> stood for wristlet watch waterproof. I think that's the right way around. I mean, I've seen it written as watch waterproof wristlet and waterproof watch wristlet and all sorts of things, but I'm sure somebody will know that exactly, exactly the correct um, way of reading out that WWW. But um, anyway, it basically meant a, a waterproof wristwatch. And, um, <clears throat> Towards the end of the Second World War, um, these specifications were, were written down and provided to the manufacturers, and they asked for a, an accurate watch, obviously, had to be reliable, had to be waterproof, had to be shockproof, had to have a black dial, had to have Arabic numerals, it had to have luminous hands and hour markers, and it had to have an outer minute track, and it had to have a shatterproof or shatter resistant uh, crystal. And the case had to be made from stainless steel with a movement that fell within very specific size parameters in order for the case to be um, of a certain size. So, as I said just now, these watches were more or less identical because uh, that's how they had to be. Um, but the interest is getting one of each from, you know, from each of the different makers, which um, it's not always that easy to do because some of the some of them were made in smaller numbers than other others. You know, something like um, the Grana probably is one of the rarer, and Timor as well. Um, <clears throat> but um, Vertex, strange enough, seems to be one that crops up a bit more often than others. I, I guess that's because it was uh, made in the UK and uh, or certainly designed in, in the UK, and um, perhaps that's why more of them have ended up up surviving. Um, <clears throat> but we're lucky enough that, to have Don with us actually, and um, uh, three or four years ago, Don Cochran um, decided to relaunch Vertex, which was uh, set up in 1916 by his great grandfather, who was a gentleman called Claude Lyons. And um, the first new Vertex came out, I think, I'm right in saying Don, three years ago. And um, it was called an M100, and it very closely resembled uh, the 1940s original, the slightly bigger case, um, <clears throat> because that was more suitable for modern wearing. But I mean, it's a pretty accurate copy of the original, but probably a lot better made and a lot more reliable. Um, and Don's idea of selling it originally was to do it by invitation only, so um, he invited 60 people uh, to buy one, and he soon found those. And then um, they were each invited, they were allowed to invite five people each, and each of those five was invited, allowed to invite one person further. So that uh, <clears throat> basically, they were, they were the, the sort of original edition, edition. and they, um, they sold that pretty quickly. And, and from that, uh, Don, you decided to sort of really get things going. And you've since made um, a few other models, including a, a lovely monopusher chronograph, and you finished uh, other versions of the M100 with the black case, and um, you're about to launch. I think is it okay to mention? Yes, the, um, I mean, mention that's fine. Yeah, well, the, you're about to launch what I think is the best one so far, which is um, a bronze case version of the M100. So um, I don't know if you want to sort of tell people what it's been like to rejuvenate a watch brand after mm. a century, and 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 what it is about that style of, of military watch that seems to have yeah, well, I mean, um, I think the military tradition and that tradition of design um, is so important because they're designed to do a job. They're not designed to be fashionable or, or cool. They're just designed to, you know, 
be accurate hard wearing all the things that you mentioned before and i think that integrity transposes so well into into modern watchwear you want something that's robust and that has integrity and narrative and a bit of a soul really um obviously vertex made watches for the british for both wars in fact i've got um as you showed earlier one of these brilliant um pocket watches that yeah put onto a leather strap that's from the first world war um and this too again is the much more demure again it's probably too bright but little trench watch yeah um and then in 1939 um actually before the dirty dozen happened um there was the army trade pattern is one of these ones um which was the first time the military had really kind of uh, talked about what watch they were going to do and here's the one that vertex made um which is very sweet. Um, but obviously, yeah, in 1943, um, they actually started the whole WWW plan. Um, and in 1944, the very first watches were delivered. Um, and a lot of watches were then delivered throughout the end of the war, 1945. But they saw service until, some of them saw service until the early 80s. So, you know, they, they got their money's worth out of them, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, the fact that this was the first time um, we really saw the sort of the black face with the white numerals was very important um, for, from a British perspective anyway. It's the first time the British had gone for that particular look. Um, and, you know, that's really where we took the, the DNA from to make the M100, which was our launch watch, um, which is really very much a, a, a larger version. I mean, put them next to each other of the day who doesn't watch. So you can kind of see day who doesn't watch here, uh, 1944, and the M100, uh, this is 19, uh, 2017, sorry. Um, but really, it was. It, I wanted to keep this watch as faithful as possible to the design of the day who doesn't watch. Um, so it's got an, a large sub-second, which takes a lot of effort to make a big sub-second because the movement has to be adjusted to, to allow for it. Um, and then um, because Luminosity was incredibly important during the war, obviously, um, and it's quite important to us now. It's also ma made with um, each numeral is made of a block of, of luminova, so it's very. You can see it here it's quite bright in here. Turn the light off. Um, there you go. You'll have see you got that. one of your? Have you got one of your special torches? Your hotel yes. room torches. Always. Um, so yeah, so they 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 glow very nicely in the dark. Um, and that sort of that's keeping with tradition, but it's also incredibly practical. Um, unless you're trying to put your children to bed, and then the lights a bit too strong sometimes. Um, but yeah, so when uh, basically Vertex um, made watches through both the wars. It also made lots of civilian watches. Um, it made civilian watches before it made anything else, um, uh, and it made civilian watches up until 1972, when due to the Quartz Watch Crisis, they decided to close the company. And then um, 40 years later, um, after following the death of my grandmother as a sort of cathartic thing, I thought it'd be nice to try and bring her father's watch company back in name, if anything else. But the more I read about it, the more I fell, fell in love with the Dirty Dozen story and the fact that those watches, certainly um, Vertex, Timor, and a couple of others that supplied watches just before D-Day um, had watches on the wrist of uh, of soldiers who fought their way up the beaches and, and then liberated Europe and then went on to liberate Asia. And you can't ask for much more from a watch than that. And as you mentioned earlier, they made um, definitive life changing decisions based on those timepieces. So, yeah, you know, it's just fascinating. Yeah, this is a great story. And well, well done for doing it because um, they're wonderful watches. And, and as I say, this bronze one, which you're about to have you, do you have a bronze one there? Benjamin? I don't because they're so secret. I didn't okay. bring them. I, didn't so I, I hope I was okay to mention surprise. Um, um, but they're rather magnificent. Brilliant. And that's well, thank basically you so much. obviously thank marking you so much. the 75th yeah. anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Which exactly, is right. Yeah. I, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank um, you. And of course, you've got your website, haven't you? So people can learn about the history you of the website. In fact, we're launching a brand new website on Friday to go with the launch of the new watch. Okay. Um, uh, but yes, there's lots of information there about that. It's vertexwatches.com, I think, isn't it? Vertex-watches.com. Hyphenwatches.com. Um, of course, the other brand that we haven't really spoken that much about, apart from um, talking about, uh, about about Rolex at the beginning and Hans Wilsdorf moving his office to Switzerland, um, 
yeah, is, is Rolex, which um, their involvement in the war was <clears throat> quite interesting, interesting because um, Rolex offered prisoners of war the chance to buy a watch while they were imprisoned. Um, but they didn't have to pay for it. They were, they were allowed to defer the payments until they uh, were released from prison at the end of the war or you know, managed to escape or managed, managed, to, um, managed to get back home somehow. Um, and it was a very astute move actually by Hans Wilsdorf, who was a brilliant sort of marketeer and uh, obviously a, a, a fabulous businessman. Um, <clears throat> because under the Geneva Con Convention, it was actually, um, not allowed to confiscate a soldier's watch if it was his own watch. But if the watch had been uh, issued, then it could be confiscated. Um, and since Rolex didn't um, officially supply watches to selling to the British military, then these watches were all owned and therefore could be um, kept hold of by the prisoners of war. And they're obviously extremely sought after uh, among military watch collectors, these, these Rolex models that were that were, were sold to um, to soldiers who were imprisoned, and um, they occasionally appear for sale. Appear for sale, and I, I was told that uh, fellows in the 1970s, before wristwatch collecting was really something that many people did, in fact, hardly anyone did. Um, one appeared at uh, fellows in an auction lot with lots of other things, and um, was bought for about three thousand pounds. That was back in the 70s, when really this story hadn't received much publicity at all. Since then, some very interesting examples have, have turned up. Two of the most interesting um, were sold by a little auction house in Buckinghamshire in the past sort of five, six years. And the, the thing that makes them particularly interesting is that they were connected with uh, Stalag Luft III, which was the famous Nazi um, prison camp, which was made famous in the, in the Steve McQueen film, The Great Escape. So the first of these watches belonged to a Wellington bomber pilot. His name was Flight Lieutenant Gerald Immerson. And he took delivery of this new uh, Rolex chronograph in 1942, while he was um, detained at Hitler's pleasure in Stalag Luft III. And um, he was one of the team who actually built the one of the three escape the, the three escape tunnels for the celebrated breakout, which happened in 1944. And he acted as one of the one of the so-called penguins, and they were called that because of the way they apparently walked across the, the prison yard um, in order to um, dispose of the excess soil which they had hidden down their trouser legs. Um, and they released it from these sort of bags sewn into, into the bottom of their trousers. He wasn't actually uh, one of the escapees, but he um, did have the Rolex when he was being marched through Germany to, um, to evade the advancing Russians. Um, and he survived that ordeal and he came back to Britain in 1947. And being a true officer and gentleman, he settled his bill with Rolex for £170 when he got back. Um, but his watch was sold in 2013, it made 50000 so um, that was quite a good buy. Um, but a couple of years later, another one of these uh, chronographs, for reference 3525 is the, the actual um, designation. This one was estimated to fetch 50,000 as well, based on the, the previous price. Um, but it sold for 165,000. And the reason for that, that it's, is that its original owner was um, Flight Lieutenant John Williams, Jack Williams, I think with him. And he was the 67th officer to actually escape um, through one of the tunnels, which was called Harry. The tunnels all had names, and this was called Harry in particular. And, um, Unfortunately, he was captured, um, as most of them were, and he was executed uh, on the orders of Hitler. But the watch was returned to his family, amazingly. Um, a, friend, a fellow prisoner of war officer um, managed to take it and look after it. Um, he was called Donald Wilson. And um, yeah, when the war was over, uh, Donald Wilson returned it to... to um, to Williams's family, and um, they, they kept it for many years. And it was sold um, in, 19, in 2015 and uh, made 165,000 pounds. These watches are rare in themselves because that particular model, I think only about 200 were made. 
not just for prisoners of war, but 200 Rolex chronographs of that era uh, with that reference number. So they're very rare anyway. And we were talking about telemeter scales before, and this is this has got one of those on it, you can see. So it's obviously a war, a watch intended for war. Um, so to have that watch and for it to have come from a prisoner of war from, from such a famous um, camp uh, obviously made it extremely valuable. We'll probably sell for a lot more than that now, actually. Um, but they just show, you know, these prices just, it just goes to show how collectible these war watches are, um, particularly Rolex models. And also, um, in this fellow sale at the end of August, there's going to be a very rare Rolex from a bit later, from the 70s. And that's going to be what is, that's what's known as a, <coughs> a, a military submariner. And, um, there's an example of it. Um, the collectors call them mill subs for obvious reasons. And these watches were made specifically for the Royal Navy, and um, they've got a special features include a, a dial marked with a tritium, uh, that T is for tritium, um, which was a, a slightly less uh, radioactive substance used to um, to make the dials luminous. And other features, they had solid bar straps so that the um, where the strap is attached, the bars are less likely to break. And the cases were stamped on the back with the um, with the military serial number and also the, the property mark. Um, and they only made these watches from 1971 till the end of the decade, so 70, 78, 79, I think. And around about 1,200 were made, so they're extremely rare, um, especially since only a couple of hundred are thought to have survived. Um, so really, these really are a sort of... Um, a bit of a holy grail watch among military watch collectors. Um, and this one, I think the estimate is about 50 to 70,000, and it will probably make that very easy. And I, I'm not sure it's got any particular history with it or any um, documentation uh, to, to sort of explain its story, but uh, it'll almost certainly make that money quite easily. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just Rolex military watches that are. Um, Proven very sought after Tudor, which is the, the sort of more affordable dial name uh, in the Rolex stable. They made uh, many military watches as well from the 50s onwards. And these are becoming uh, really sought after, particularly those that were made for the French and the American navies, among others. Um, <clears throat> in fact, there's a whole sort of other subject to be spoken about in terms of sort of watches made from the 50s and 70s for, for the military around the world. Um, and they're so popular among collectors that obviously, you know, modern the modern day brands have uh, gone to great lengths to recreate the look of these military watches because military anything is, is sort of quite popular and quite trendy nowadays. And um, being able to get that military look seems to be something that, that certainly younger watch buyers want. And there are some very good um, replicas or, or sort of modern interpretations of those military watches. Um, even by brands that never even you know, made a military watch or weren't even around when military watches were um, were in existence. I mean, one good example is, is Bremont, which is a young, relatively young British brand. It's been around since about 2007, making watches. Um, but they have a very strong following with the military and they've made many um, special edition watches for regiments and squadrons and so on. And recently launched um, three different watches which are all based on military designs from the um, from the 40s. And they're very good. They're very good, but there's no real military connection um, from the war from from the war because obviously the, the brand didn't exist until until this century. So, um, but if you want a, an authentic modern military watch and don't want to spend much money on it, there's a, a make called CWC, which is actually an official supplier to the MOD. Um, Sensor Cabot Watch Company, and they've been selling watches to the MOD for at least 30 years for you know pilots, divers, and sort of general service watches. And the definitive CWC model is called uh, the G10 Quartz Watch, and it's got a 38 millimeter case and a, a, an acrylic crystal, very simple black dial, just of the, the type that um, is, is typical of a, a military watch, luminous hands and hour markers and so on. And you can buy a new one for about £150. Um, there is also a mechanical version, which is a bit more. 
But the interesting thing about what that watch is in the name, it's called the G10 watch. And the reason it's called that is because it is supplied with the G10 strap, which um, again, they've become very popular among uh, you know, watch collectors and people that want to make a watch um, look different simply by changing the strap. And these G10 straps are made from nylon. And they have an unusual feature in, in there is sort of they have a sort of double layer which enables them to um, attach to the watch in such a way that if one of the bars of the watch gets broken the um, the watch won't actually fall off, off the wrist as long as the buckle is still joined together the watch can stay on the wrist with with only one bar still intact um, and these straps as I say have become very popular they're often called NATO straps but the, the correct British military designation is the G10. And to be a true G10 strap, it should really only be um, a sort of pale, uh, a pale to mid, mid tone gray. Um, and strictly speaking, it should be about 20 millimeters, or should be 20, millim 20 millimeters wide, can be 18 millimeters um, in this admiralty gray color, and should have chrome brass buckles and keepers. Um, and then that very special feature, which I mentioned to you just now about the, the sort of double layering. Um, but obviously, <clears throat> just the style of those straps has become hugely popular with, with uh, collectors and watch wearers. And now you get all sorts of different designs and colors and stripes and um, patterns and so on. Um, but they're not strictly speaking uh, what you would call a G10 strap or, an, or a NATO strap. That doesn't matter at all. Nobody cares about that. So that pretty much is the the story of military watches up until until now, I guess. And um, hopefully, it's raised a bit of interest among a few new people. And um, maybe it's going to make make you want to have a look at this this sale at Kellos at the end of the month and have a look at the Millsap and in particular at the Dirty Dozen watches. Um, so we've got a couple of people from Kellos available to answer any questions if you have any about forthcoming sales or watches that you might want to sell. Yeah. Um, Don's here yes. and if you want to ask me a question like you can do. I don't know if I'll be able to answer it accurately, but I'll try. Um, so if anyone can answer then someone has Harold. their hand up. Um, if I press allow to talk, Harold you should be able to talk so see if that works. I'm sure. Is that, is that working Harold? I think you're on mute. Working, or you can type out questions as well. Equally, you don't have to you don't have to speak. Right, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Right, okay. <clears throat> I mean, I'm one of these old craft members, BHI crafts members, and <clears throat> I came into the trade the end of the fifties, beginning of the sixties. <clears throat> Most, well, a lot of watchmakers, their bench clock was an aircraft clock, and at that time, a lot of these military watches were coming into civilian use. So I must have prepared a few of them over the years. Now it's ironic that such a high quality watch had such a short life. I mean, how many of the, those watches lived for more than six months? A officer wore them. In fact, my younger son was working in the, well, I did an internship in the archive of the Imperial War Museum and they found my in the London Gazette my father's name gazetted and they said a lot of the officers by the time their name was in the Gazette they were dead so it's amazing that such a high quality watch was basically disposable I suppose the thing, the thing is, Harold, that nowadays, you know, you can make these quartz watches very cheaply, but there was no option then, was there? Oh, yes. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. I mean, no. I had, I mean, on my bench at the moment, I've got, I think it's a Helvetia 51 stroke 10 pilot's watch that's been absolutely mutilated. <clears throat> but you look on eBay, they're making seven, eight thousand dollars. Right. But anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that so much of this military stuff was so well made. Yes. Most probably didn't last more than a year. In fact, a number of years ago, I was given an Elgin military, it was an American military watch to repair. 
And I was most probably the first person to unscrew that back. Right. And it, you could smell Windle's oil. You could, it had, you took the back off, there was that musty smell. And that most probably had never been worn. Otherwise, it would have been in bits at Guadalcanal. And do you find that more people are bringing these original um, wartime watches to you to be, to be restored or refurbished? Well, what I tend to get is what they call vintage. Where <clears throat> I've got a custom, I mean, I'm sort of, I mean, you know, I'm going to be 77 soon. So I'm sort of retired. Um, but I tend to get inverted commas, basket cases of all sorts. But generally speaking, these things have had a very hard life. Some of them, are, and they've been well butchered. There are no parts available. And um, they were most probably never meant to last as long as they did. Mm. I mean, when you consider something like a marine chronometer was very roughly made. It had no finish to it. I'm sure most of them went down down with the ship at the fourth fourth yes. point. But no, I'm not no, I'm not saying it was such I mean, my point is such a high quality for mm. such a short life. Yes. But that, that's how watches were. In those days <clears throat> a person bought a watch. You got it for a twenty first or something like that, and you expected it to last forever. Mm. Now Kids have watches like, you know, they have they have they're so cheap. I mean, my sailing watch is a fifty a fifteen pound plastic Casio. If it fills up with water, I'll throw it away. It I guess Don's the right person to sort of chat about this in terms of like how well yeah, watches are made. So Vertex are doing it in the. Oh, but I think it's lovely. Oh, yeah. A lot of the old Vertexes we get um, back to look at are still working. Pretty well. I mean, for a 70 or 80 year old watch, they're still running just fine. Obviously, they've, they've been through a lot. Certainly, the watches that saw service, although they may have only, as Harold mentioned, have served service with one person for a short period of time, they were then taken back into the stores and then um, put back out again. So they, they saw service uh, certainly um, from 1945 or 1944 till 1968, when we know a lot were then sold um, let go. They saw service in, in many different campaigns and with many different uh, personnel. So although they, they passed through hands quickly, possibly, they, they definitely had a long life. Yes, but you take, yes, but you take those watches now <coughs> that were made in, say, 1940, strip it down, put it through the cleaning machine, put it together. You will find where your barrel holes aren't badly worn, your barrel's not leaving, leaning over to one side, your stem hole's not, not egg-shaped. They were built like, they were Victorian engineering. They were built to last forever. Absolutely, that's, I think it's brilliant, isn't it? We've got lots of lovely watches still surviving nowadays, even though they're really old and some of them been through some stuff, haven't they? I think, again, that goes back to the heart of why people love military watches because they were fit for purpose. They were designed to do their job and they're still doing their job now. Wonderful. Anyway, I'm not going to hog, hog any more time. I think <laughs> I've, I've had my, over my money. Thank you, Harold. Lovely to hear you, Harold. Thank you. Whereabouts is your workshop? Well, I work, for, I work from home. Lovely. Yeah, great. Well, keep, um, keep, make, keep those watches going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and all, all the best. Thank you, Harold. Bye bye. We've got some really interesting questions coming in. Actually, I've had the same question sort of twice. So, if I put them together, so Graham um, says you mentioned the Gerard Perigo watch, um, and he's been re he's researching um, for a book called Wristwatches, and he says that no Good. original watch is. How, ever how did you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, he thinks that if thousands were made, it was surprising if there's this um, the original Perigo watches, if thousands were made, then that would be surprising. Um, and also Nicholas asked, um, those watches, the, the Kaiser's watches, do we see any? I mean, that's kind of a similar question. Like where, where are these yes, watches? Yes. Well, that's a very good question. I think there were 2,000 were made. I mean, he had a massive army. <clears throat> and I guess they were made for his officers. But, um, and I'm sure some have cropped up, but I've never seen one. I'm, I'm only repeating 
information that I've I've sort of let, picked up along the way. Um, but yes, you know, some were apparently made and sold to America. Um, but I think the answer to that is to probably go to the Giro Perigo Museum um, or look at the book about Giro Perigo, Perigo because I'm sure there's something in there which will um, give an indication <coughs> about how many left and where they are. That's I think be the best bet. Yeah. If, um, yes, sir, I have got a Giro Perigo book actually somewhere in here. So I could, if, if somebody wants to email me, I could. Give them the details of the book and let them know if there's anything in there. Um, I've got a couple of other questions. Um, this might be a bit broad, so it might need to be like a quick answer. But what is the history of the Amiga Fifty Six military watch? I can't. I don't know. Apart from the fact, <laughs> <laughs> the history in what, in what respect? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I just said the that was all the question. Yeah, the question was just the history. Um, yeah. If you'd like us to expand, let us know what, what you really want to know about the Amiga. That'd be that'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, um, yes, I, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry, not easily anyway. I've got a couple. Um, I'm actually maybe Don, you can answer this one. Ash Edwards asks, "Do you know how they got the WWW watches out of Switzerland?" Um, well, there's a few different stories of how it was done. Um, some were smuggled out, obviously, because. Uh, Certainly, the bit, a lot of movements were smuggled out of uh, Germany, uh, sorry, out of Switzerland during the whole of the war, because obviously we, we weren't really making movements in the UK at that time. Most of the watch companies had been turned into munitions companies. Your timing mechanisms were then being put into torpedoes rather than watches. Um, so the, the, a lot was smuggled out. Um, I know some of the WWW watches came in in a bus that was, uh, that was shipped from there to here on a boat, um, bizarrely. Um, but yeah, but, uh, annoyingly, there's a lot of dark history at that point, partly because most of the records concerning the WW were stored at Royal Signals Corps, and that particular building burnt down in 1974. So, so many files, uh, which include the information about this sort of thing, which we'd love to know, uh, are missing. But the bus story, I've, I've heard from a few people, including my grandfather, and he was there, so I, I believe in it. You would know. It's fascinating. Um, I guess in terms of like smuggling and all that kind of question, we've got another one saying about the prisoner of war relics. If Simon, were they limited to officers only? So yes, they were. So, uh, I think they were. Yeah. So you have uh, I mean, Hans Wilson obviously didn't want to take too much of a risk. He thought <laughs> the officers, you know, I guess were more likely to be able to pay for them than the, you know, the private or the or the corporal. Or the people lower down the line. It's a bit, um, a bit discriminatory, I suppose, isn't it? A little bit, but I guess they're being paid more potentially. Yeah. Have the money to spend on the Um. Oh, Ash, who you answered his question, Don. Um. He said he's been led to believe they were flown out low and fast over Germany by specially converted mosquito. Yeah. I mean, I again, I've heard that story, but there's just this whole story is annoyingly, <laughs> which is. <laughs> Uh, we actually we started a research product project with um, the Imperial War Museum, um, going through a lot of archive stuff to try and find some facts to go with some of these stories, including doing some research with the Royal British Legion, and talking to some of the surviving, uh, not so many of them now, um, people that served at that time to try and kind of get the right answers. So we're working on it. Brilliant. Um... Mike asked, and maybe one of my colleagues from Fellows can stick their hand up and I can get them to jump in on this. Um, so as an avid and passionate mill sub collector, I enjoy the backstory of the watches in my collection. Are you able to divulge any of the history to the 5517 coming up in the sale? Now, if they don't know immediately, Mike, we can always get them to um, email you afterwards. Uh, aha, Laura. There we go. You're, there you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, sadly, we don't have any history with it at all. It is just a private vendor who I think um, bought it for himself a few years ago and simply wants to sell it on. Sadly, we don't have any paper or any provenance with it. It is in amazing condition, however. So it is uh, all genuine, all original, but sadly just a watch by itself. So, Laura, what do you think about 
you know, if, if you could put a percentage on it, how much does it add to the value of one of these watches? If you've got, for example, I don't know, you know, a, a logbook with it from some diver who's owned it, or um, you know, evidence of what it's been been through, kind of thing. Think that makes um, a significant difference. Significant difference. It, I think it does, like you said earlier, it's almost like the watch is half the value, and the yeah. provenance. Honestly, it does make up about the other the other fifty percent. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe not as much as 50%, but it is people do like the background, the story, and you know, the provenance and the photographs. Yeah. It really does make a big difference. Have you have you ever tried actually, because you've got this year's serial numbers on the watches and so on, have you have you ever been sort of tempted or, or even tried to sort of go back to the MOD and, you know, ask for records that might say who it's been issued to and so on? Um, we haven't. As far as I'm aware, we haven't in the past, but it would be something that definitely would be interesting we could consider it definitely for the future yeah because if you had a name just one name you could it could start you off on a you know on the, on the path to discovering a bit more about it I suppose. yeah definitely I was like fun actually that's probably the sort of job that Laura would say oh this sounds like a fun PR job <laughs> yes. good. Something, you, something for you to do yeah yeah exactly <laughs> oh thank you Laura that's really interesting thank you um so um MOD, uh, Mike's saying the MOD doesn't have the records what we can always try. Maybe we can contact the National Army Museum or something. You never know. Can I do some digging? I'll email you afterwards, Mike, and see what, what we can do. Oh, it's an interesting question about the Dirty Dozen. Um, how exactly were the Dirty Dozen watches allocated? Did individual service personnel request specific models or brands, or were they simply distributed randomly? Is there any information on how many are still in existence? Okay, start with the end one. Uh, no, there isn't, um, <laughs> because they all went off into the world. There's even very little information on how many actually existed in the first place. Omega and IWC still have their records because they've stayed in single partner ownership all that time, but no one else has. So it's it, it's very kind of loose, that piece of information. As far as how they were distributed, as far as we're aware, it was almost randomly. Um, the only record Vertex still has is we supplied 400 watches to Bomber Command, um, but, but that's the only specific unit that we have information on. Um, but I don't think people had a choice in what watch they got. They, they were made, some were made in greater numbers than others, weren't they? I mean, Absolutely. They were yeah. Numbers. So we were fairly prolific, but then obviously yeah. Brian only makes eight hundred odd watches, apparently. So yeah. yeah. So in terms of like how a company became the supplier to particular branches, would that be down to the various requisition officers in say? the Navy and say this part of the world or, or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my understanding was it was who could fulfill the brief and actually honor the supply. Um, there's, there's lots of um, potential stories about uh, certain Swiss manufacturers holding back supply because the war was ending and, and they didn't want to get in any trouble. But um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's all, I mean, we're trying to learn a lot about it at the moment. Um, so, watch the space. Brilliant, it's exciting. Um, oh, someone has their hand up. So, Ash, I'm going to press allow to talk for you and see if you can uh, unmute yourself, see if that works. I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just thought I'd jump in quickly on a couple of the ones. The MOD <laughs> acquisition process is normally that we put out to tender a requirement and a number of civilian bidders will then pitch in and say, we can meet this, that and the other, and the MOD will then select. So I suspect what would have happened from reading up a little bit about the history of it and also knowing how the system works today is that you will basically get a, you have got the right price, you've got the right watch, we'll take it, and it would be based on supply and the demand would have been set by the MOD. Um, on the second point, with reference to getting them issued, it's the same today. I even tested theory a couple of years ago. You just go to the stores and you ask for a military issue wristwatch, which nobody seems to do because um, they're all just sat there uh, waiting. They're a new, by the way, so don't get too excited. They're the Pulsar ones, so you're not going to you're not getting any IWs. Nice, I like them. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I got I got one, um, but um, yeah, you literally would just ask for it because most of the um, army timepieces would have still been in circulation. And so the QM would be trying to get rid of old stock, just like good stock control within Civvy Street. So uh, I think that's... What about the CWC ones, Ash? Do, do they still dish those out or not? I haven't seen a CWC, to be honest with you, for a long time. And, and actually, I heard a horrible story. I don't know if I should relay it. 
um, yeah, do. more more horrifying than anything on operations is that um, uh, the IWC is it the Mark Eleven yeah. sold off in batches of ten in the eighties for a ridiculously low number. Don't you know you go to a government auction and it's just yeah. about getting rid of stuff. It's not about getting good value. Yeah, careful what I say, of course. I mm-hmm. shouldn't say too much. But um, and and just on the first point, I will I will I will go silent in a second. On the first point, unfortunately, um, most of the young officers I train and teach wear the Casio. G, they even call it the Casio G10. That's the one I see most frequently on the wrist. Oh, right officers or their father's Rolex, which I couldn't possibly compete with anything that I could possibly buy. But um, yeah, we still, however you might be pleased to know, there's hope, we still do synchronize watches as the last step in a set of orders. When you deliver orders, the last thing to do is synchronize watches and then any questions. That still goes on today. Hard to do that with the with the quartz watch, you know, sort of uh, LCD watch or? Well, yeah, notionally, we all take time. But we, we, on operations, you take time from GPS and the artillery will, as far as I'm aware, dictate time. So the battery commander, who's part of your battle group headquarters, they will literally dictate the time is currently this. Right. But even that might be old school because everything's done from GPS now. Yeah, so, that's very interesting. That's really interesting, Ash. I mean, what we were talking to us, uh, one of the MAD supply things recently and they were saying how they don't want any um, uh, watches with GPS or any signal giving ability in the field because they don't want people necessarily to know where they are or possibly be giving out any signals from where they are. Exploitation of the electromagnetic spectrum is is a really, um, it's a really key part of um, the intelligence gathering type thing. Um, And yeah, you absolutely will be sending out silly amounts of signals. And so I don't know if you saw the news article a while ago that you could see where an American SF base was in, I can't remember where, because people have been using their running monitors, their their GPS, their running trackers for Strava times and so on. And so they literally had outlined um, on Strava or whatever it was. This is a funny shaped part of the desert. Why is it so frequented by all these Americans? So um, yeah, we've got to be really careful about that stuff. It's it's everywhere. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about army stuff, but this is your your lecture not mine oh, thanks Ash. it's really interesting yeah really thank you very much indeed no worries thanks Ash. someone's just popped up and said they're not in stores anymore the cwc but Funny. i mean i think when i was finding all the photos we see a lot of them through mm. the auction so i think i guess at one point Sunday, i think you can buy them right now army certainly there's an army surplus store where you can, you can buy them in, in london <clears throat> um or you certainly couldn't quite recently um, oh, Graham's come back about the Jura Perigo um, Kaiser watches and says yeah. he thinks the one in the museum is a, is a replica. So, um, right. gosh. No, well, yes, it, um, it'd be interesting to uh, to see a real one for sure. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions from anybody else? I think I've got through all of the typed ones. If anybody has any other ones, they can raise their hand and we can chat through i think my question to you um simon would be what is your sort of you touched on a couple that sold for silly amounts of money um in geneva what would be the best or the most exciting watch that you've seen a military watch that you've seen sell in your time sort of reporting on auctions or in terms of the watch industry in general um well i think uh, those panerais they, they do seem to be the ones that um have stories with them um and the fact that they were made specifically for the military, they weren't, you know, they were, they were only used by, really, by, by the military. And the, the other story that's quite interesting is that um, there's some sort of speculation that while Panerai itself now says that they were made for the Italian Navy, that there's also some suggestion they were actually made for the Germans as well, which is why these camp swimmers had them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, claim, the claim is that the camp swimmers seized them from Italians. Um, or got them from from Italians and um, got them that way and, and weren't officially supplied with them. But there is some talk that they actually were officially supplied. So there's there's a whole sort of intrigue around um, those particular watches, which I think makes it very interesting. And the, the Rolex connection, the fact that they very much sort of um, sort of cobbled together in a way, um, but still you know saw service and were used. I think that, that makes them quite quite interesting. 
I think it's the provenance, isn't it? So the, the ones that we saw doing the research for it and having all of the, so that they were both taken on the same operation, the, the boat yeah. that we saw, and to have the, the two points of view exactly backing mm -hmm. each other up and to have the handwritten notes and everything. It's just yeah. amazing that somebody kept all of that. And yeah, it is. Incredible. It is, yeah. Question that we've been asked before is, I think you wanted a little bit in your talk, but previously people would, um, soldiers and officers would buy their watches as themselves but when they're part of the sort of uniform and they're part of what you need to get do you not have to hand them back when you leave service or? Supposed to, as, don, as don was saying you know a lot of his um the original vertex watches went round a few times you know and were issued yeah. and brought back and so on but um the reason the property mark is on them the the fion or the broad arrow is you know so i think the idea was that you know you didn't sort of forget to hand it back and if you did you know that they could be traced but that's obviously not worked very well because um, enough of them turn up for sale, don't they? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I suppose officially they may not be, well, obviously don't have to delve into that too much, but I suppose officially they could still belong to the to the government, a lot of them. But Ash has said, yeah, you should sign them back in. Yeah. Okay. Well, you should, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Anybody that's got them, you should sign them back in. Um, brilliant. Well, well, when they find out how much they're selling for now, they'll probably come and Probably can claim them all back so they can shore up the defence budget with the, with the <laughs> <laughs> it's some vintage military watches. Brilliant. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I think we should say thank you to both Simon and to Don for coming along. And it was really interesting. It was great to have you as a special guest on and talk about the Vertex. Well, thank you for asking me very much indeed. And um, it was great to see so many people listening, but they weren't too bored. Thank you for inviting me too. It's an honour to be here. Good to see you, Don. Let me see you. Good to see you, Simon. Looking forward to that bronze watch. Yeah, <laughs> we've got a... Monday. Monday, you'll... everyone gets to see it on Monday. That's very exciting. We will send out things on social media as well, directing people to the launch, because I think it's going to be fascinating. Um, what a brilliant commemoration of 75 years after the war. So, wow. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely. We'll be with the sale at the end of the month, Laura. And... Um, Looking forward to seeing, hearing what happens. Thank you, Simon. We will definitely let you know. Okay, do. Nice to see you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Bye. for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.